We want to begin or actually continue the series, but today begin looking at certain efforts that false teachers have developed to circumvent our Lord's teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Now, I will not be going back over the material we spent quite some time on last Sunday afternoon in establishing just what that law is. So if you would like to listen to it or view it, then it is posted on Facebook on the church page, and I have noticed that it's been picked up and put all sorts of places in this past week. So if you would care to see it and review it, then that'll be great as far as that's concerned, but we're not going to try to do that right now. We're just going to go on into what we announced we would last week. Our Lord's plan of marriage and divorce remarriage, I think, is quite a simple one, but it all is dependent upon our own honesty toward God ourselves and what the Bible teaches, as it is with anything God would have us do that pertains to living righteously before Him. We must be willing to accept it. However, because of the proliferation of divorces for every cause today, there are those even in the church of our Lord who attempt to set aside the truth that we studied last week concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Some of these are harder to understand, at least on the surface, than it is what the Lord had said about it in the first place. And I think sometimes that is exactly what happens when people try to set aside what's plainly set out in the Bible because they're unwilling to accept it. They want something else, so they've got to go about to establish their own doctrines. Most try to appear scholarly and they cite all sorts of Greek and Hebrew words. But we must remember that when the New Testament was written, it was written in the Koine, the common Greek of the first century. And all of those warnings about false teachers were originally written in Greek. So just to say that you've cited the Greek, which is what they would have cited anyway <laughs> in the first century, is not to say you've used it correctly, nor reasoned with it correctly. I say again, all that you have in the New Testament was originally written in the original Greek language. So you can abuse and misuse the Greek today, just like false teachers did when they spoke in it regularly and wrote in it in the first century. So just because a person tries to appear scholarly doesn't mean that he is. People have funny ways in their minds of determining whether a person is a scholar, that is, somebody really knowledgeable of something. And how they do that, I, I don't know. I think sometimes I've heard people say that they didn't really understand what he said because his message was too scholarly. Well, that's not a scholar. A scholar, a true scholar, is able to take difficult matters and teach them in a way that when the people he's teaching are using their minds correctly and they're honest with what they're hearing, they can understand it. Now, if anybody wanted to be scholarly, our Lord could. He's called the master teacher. He's the greatest of the great. There's no greater than he. And if ever there was somebody who could teach on a level of understanding, that he could. Well, then... What are we going to say about that? A scholar takes difficult things and makes it as simple as the subject will allow it to be so people he teaches will understand it. That's what we're after. That's why we've got a Bible. That's what Paul said to Timothy was the reason for the revelation of God's Word to man. The Bible is for the good of man. It's for instruction in righteousness. Now, if we don't get it, it's not because the Bible hasn't been given in the way it ought to have been given from God to man. There must be something wrong then with us as to our attitude, our disposition of mind toward God's Word. Sometimes they'll refer to 
various commentaries, all sorts of pioneer preachers, and on down the line. Well, it may be very good to consult a number of these things, but the Bible and the Bible only remains the only rule of faith and practice. I like, as I've quoted from time to time over the years, what I heard an elderly lady, a sister in the church, say when a preacher asked her how much she liked the commentary that had been given to her as a gift. And her remark was simply this, the Bible sheds a lot of light on it. So we need to know what a commentary does. It's not the little commentaries, but we're still obligated to study the Bible for ourselves. And you can't uh, do any better than being sure you have an honest and good heart when you study it with the intent to do whatever it is God tells you to do when you learn it. So we'll attempt to deal with these arguments thoroughly, <clears throat> yet we'll try to make them as brief and simple as we can. The first one is the one, as a young person, before I ever started preaching, I first was introduced to before marriage, divorce, free marriage is such a problem in this country and even in the church. And that is, there's just simply, for a divorced person, no right to remarry at all. And this is, as I say, the first one we will deal with. And it comes from the conservative side of the matter rather than from those who want to loose us from what God's Word binds on us on this subject. It is granted that the Lord planned for marriages to be permanent, that divorce is only possible in the case of an innocent party putting away his or her spouse because that spouse committed fornication. However, this view, as I said a moment ago, allows for no remarriage for even the innocent party. You don't hear about this much, but sometimes you do. Advocates of this particular view, this false doctrine, apparently don't appreciate the force of the acceptive clause of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Jesus said in Mark's account, chapter 10, verse 11, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. As we said several times last week, Mark's account in Mark 10 is the general rule. And he who made the general rule, our Lord, the legislator, can also make the exception. Matthew records the one exception to the general rule. Let me once again remind us, as we do from time to time, when it comes to ascertaining the authority of our Lord and knowing how to do it. We must take all of what the Bible says on the subject, reason correctly with it, before we draw our conclusion and expect to come to the right conclusion. <clears throat> Putting away one's wife and marrying another constitutes adultery with but one exception. When that exception occurs, then it's not adultery. That exception is that one has put away his spouse because his spouse has committed fornication, pornea, sexual acts outside the marriage. Advocates of this view are false teachers who, in their attempt to be strict, are guilty of making a law that God did not make. They disallow that which God allows. They're not the... That's not the only law, that's the only doctrine that does that, but it is, in this case, a marriage, divorce, free marriage. They ignore our Lord's one exception clause. They really have no more respect for the Lord's will than do the liberals who loose us by their doctrines from what God and His Word has bound on us and thus try to circumvent the truth. It is as great a sin to bind where God has loosed as it is to loose where God has bound. Neither is the Lord's will. But some will aver there's never an innocent party in a divorce. I think I've heard that pretty much all my life. There's never an innocent party in a divorce. Both sides contribute to the divorce. Therefore... There could not be a case 
where remarriage could take place because both parties are always guilty. Well, those who thus argue are apparently wiser than the Lord himself. While, they may, while there may be guilt on the part of both partners in a marriage, which marriage ends in divorce, this certainly is not always the case. If there were not individuals, listen to me, if there were not individuals who had a right to divorce a mate, a spouse who committed fornication, and then the innocent party remarry, our Lord will not have given the exception clause. It makes the whole of Matthew 19, wherein uh, he's dealing with marriage, divorce, remarriage, ridiculous. Because he does give an exception clause. If and only if a spouse commits fornication, may the innocent and the fornication spouse put or divorce that spouse guilty of fornication. Now to say there's nobody can remarry is just to speak against the Lord. It's to make a law God didn't make. So we would reject the no right to marry at all. There's another one. And that is that Matthew chapter 19 is not, I say is not, a part of the New Covenant or New Testament. Again, all these efforts are attempts to circumvent our Lord's teaching. So they argue that the passages in the gospel accounts, especially Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, do not apply to us today. And they say they don't apply to us today because they were given while the law of Moses was still in effect for the Jews. They would say that only that which is taught from Pentecost, as recorded by Luke in Acts 2, is binding upon us today. That's how they argue. That's their basic false premise. Well, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, does not apply to us in the Christian age. Then who do you apply it to? Who is amenable to it? It was different, as we studied last week, from the Mosaic legislation, such as you find in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. Surely we know that the law of Moses was still binding when Jesus uttered it. It's the way the Jews, while it was binding, approached God. Remember what I said last week about Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well? And she brought up the idea that you Jews say down there in Jerusalem is the place to worship. We worship here in this mount. Jesus did not hesitate to say salvation is of the Jews. You don't even know what you worship. We know what we worship. Obviously then, the law of Moses was still binding while Jesus walked this earth. Well, what Jesus taught, Matthew 19, 9, was certainly different from what Moses taught in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. If it didn't apply when Jesus spoke it, and it does not apply today, can you guess the next question? When did it ever apply? The truth of the matter is that the gospel accounts deal with a transition period. The law of Moses truly was still in effect, as I've said several times already. Jesus kept it, and he taught other Jews to keep it. Matthew 5, 17 through 19, and so many other passages. It ended... When our Lord died on Calvary's cross, according to Paul in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. But when Jesus worked on this earth, one of the things he was doing was preparing for his kingdom, the church. He gave teachings to his disciples, which would become, if you please, the constitution of the kingdom once it was established on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. The same argument which would say that Matthew 19 and verse 9 is not binding upon us in the Christian age would also be applied to the teaching of everything there is in the Sermon on the Mount. The principles that are taught in the parables our Lord gave. And for that matter, even the Great Commission, since it was given 
or at the time that it was given because it was given before the church was established, Acts chapter 2. Are they all not binding even though they were stated before that Pentecost day Luke writes about in Acts 2? Cannot a king prepare a constitution before his coronation and set it in force as law upon his ascension to the throne? And again, I remind you, this was a transition period, and that's very important to keep in mind. There's another one, and that is the guilty party has a right to remarry. In other words, a person put away for fornication has scriptural authority to contract another marriage. And that's a very popular position among those who are not satisfied with our Lord's true law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we must recognize it for what it is, just another attempt to dodge the Lord's teaching. Now, we've already dealt with this essentially when we did study last week, Matthew 19, 3 through 9. We observed that the right of remarriage is given to the innocent party not to the one who is put away for fornication. Surely God does not reward a man or a woman for either one's sin. A guilty person who's been put away can repent of his or her sin and receive God's forgiveness. But they can never remarry without sin. A lot of people just don't understand that. But you can be forgiven of sin and not qualified to do something. People say, well, that's just hard. I just can't accept that. Anybody ever hear of Proverbs 13, 15? The way of the transgressor is hard. People get themselves into big messes because they will not listen to the truth. They will not be governed by it. And then... They don't want to do, go through what is necessary or make the necessary sacrifices to get out of it. That's the reason we warn against sin in the first place. Remember, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. All in the name of the Lord Jesus certainly covers marriage, certainly covers divorce, and certainly covers remarriage. They have used an argument known as the handcuff argument, frequently made in order to try to say the guilty of fornication party who's been put away has a right or authority from God to remarry. This argument says that when a man and a woman are handcuffed together, if one is released from, from the other, then the other's also free, not bound at all to the other. Well, as we pointed out in last week's sermon, and has been pointed out many times, this handcuff illustration or argument does not fit marriage for the simple reason there are more than two parties involved. If we would keep that in mind, it would help a whole lot in getting things started off on the right course between two people who have never been married in the first place. Matthew 19, 6 says God joins the man and woman together. If they are eligible for marriage according to the teaching of the New Testament, God joins them together. God is a partner in every scriptural marriage. Again, I say Matthew 19, 6. A man and a woman, if you please, we'll put it in quote, or quotes, are handcuffed to each other in marriage. They're bound to one another. But they're also handcuffed to God. They're handcuffed to God by the law of God. Because it's God that joined them together. Even though a scripturally put away person is free from his marriage partner, he is still bound by the law of God. And the law of God does not give him the right, does not authorize him to remarry as it does the innocent party. It's all a matter of saying, what does Jesus Christ authorize? And he does not authorize the person guilty of fornication and the innocent party having, putting away that, having put away that guilty person, that guilty person, I say, to 
remarry. It's just not there. Now people are going to bring up things like, well, what if there's kids in the marriage? The way of the transgressor is hard. Anybody ever remember David and Bathsheba? Anybody ever remember Paul saying of those Old Testament accounts that they were written aforetime for our learning? That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope? Do we not realize that Paul is saying the Old Testament scriptures can teach us the importance of obedience to the truth of God under the New Testament of Jesus Christ? David and Bathsheba, under the law of course, committed fornication. A child was conceived. As punishment for that fornication, which was adultery because Bathsheba was married and so was David for that matter. You'll remember that the baby died. Innocent child had nothing to do with the sin of mom and daddy. The baby died and it was punishment. Now if you read the rest of the story, you'll see that God also punished the household of David. All sorts of problems that grew up because of this as punishment. The problem with us nowadays is that we want to sin and there not be any repercussions. That never has been the case. If an innocent child, not yet walking, is crawling on the floor and gets something and sticks it in an electrical outlet and makes the right contact, as innocent as it is, as ignorant of it is, the law of electricity is going to shock that child, and if it stays connected long enough, it'll kill it. Now, who made that law? God did in the natural realm. When it comes to the spiritual realm, the only thing that can separate any of us from God is sin. And the only thing that can send us to torment is to die guilty of one or more sins. In fact, just one sin. Now, God's authored a plan, but it is extended through the authority of His Son's will in the words of the New Testament. It's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. It is the gospel system. That's how the favor of God that no man deserves and no man can merit is extended to mankind. It's through the terms of pardon in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we want to do all things by the authority of Christ. That authority is manifest in the words of Christ. That's why we must study to show ourselves approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We must ascertain the authority of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, what if you don't love him? And you don't keep his commandments. Is it the same for that person as it is for the person who loves him and keeps his commandments? There are terrible consequences for people who break God's law. And people can be forgiven of those things. But they still have suffered the consequences. A person could be a drunk, not a member of the Lord's church. And in driving undergo a traffic accident. The person's neck's broken. Quadriplegic for the rest of his life. Laying up in bed, his whole viewpoint of everything jarred to the core and seeing things completely different. He begins to read the Bible. He learns the truth. He's baptized into Christ. Every sin is forgiven. He's still a quadriplegic suffering the consequences of his sins committed before he obeyed the gospel. People who come upon the teachings of God when it comes to marriage, divorce, remarriage, when that spouse has violated the trust and the promises and the covenant by committing fornication and the innocent party so desires because it can't be reconciled, the trust is broken, to put away the guilty party. And that guilty party has no authority from God to contract a marriage with another person. Hard, just as hard as David's baby dying because he committed fornication. 
and just as hard as that little innocent baby who would electrocute himself, though he didn't know even what electricity was. The laws of God, when violated in nature and when violated spiritually, bring forth consequences. What we need to do, and we seem to just be terribly hard to persuade in general to see it, is to realize that when we have illustrations like that of actual things, that it should cause us to see how heinous in the eyes of God sin is. And when you see what it costs God to forgive us of our sins, to make forgiveness possible, and where he's going to consign people who die in sin because they will not take advantage of the mercy and grace of God extended through the gospel, surely that helps our feeble minds to see that it's not playing checkers when you're approaching God. And you think of when... Moses was called of God, or he turned aside actually to see the bush that was not consumed by the fire. When he approached that bush, the voice came, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. We do not think of serving God, a holy God, and the sobriety that ought to be on our minds, and the reverence with which we approach him, and how he expects us to approach him in keeping his word. It's because we don't spend a lot of time with the Bible and we live in a very convenient age where really we just think, oh, let's just go ahead and do as we please. That's, that's the motto of the age, folks. It's all around us. And you see it reflected in the church. And so we're studying all these false doctrines that try to get around Matthew 19.6 and Matthew 19.9 so people can still feel like God's with me. He's with me as a fornicator an adulterer, a homosexual, and gender reassignment. Folks, if, if you can use these false doctrines and concoct them to get around the truth of marriage, divorce, remarriage, you can come up with all sorts of other deceptive things to justify every one of those I just said. We need to understand that. And if the Lord's church is to be the Lord's church and every Christian of Christ, as that means it, then we must have authority from God for what we believe in practice and surely that's the case when it comes to the basic unit of society, and that is marriage and the home. Let us not be deceived. And I hope as we continue on through these at other times with these false doctrines and refute them in the time that we have, that it will make us mindful of the seriousness of what it is to sin. And that when we sin, then the consequences are there to face. That's one reason, if not the reason, that we're taught, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, and thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Don't build a life of sinning. Don't build a life where you used to sin and get caught up in all of the trouble that sin brings on. And then you get things so wound up that it's next to impossible to break yourself from them. You can... But all too often, you're just not willing to make the sacrifice. And all that that means you have to do to adjust your life in order to be, once again, in harmony with the will of the Almighty. We need to get it over to ourselves and to everybody else. It is serious, critical business to deal with God and how one lives his life on this earth. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. That's when we want to be able to say we've lived our lives when it comes to everything, but now specifically marriage, divorce, or remarriage, having lived it in harmony with the authority of our Lord. For He and He alone is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him, John 14, 6. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we plead with you, we beg you by the mercies of Christ to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. He'll add you to his church, and in that church you can live faithful to him till time is no more and heaven is your home. As a child of God, is the Lord leading you to live the Christian life through his good word?
If you sin, the Lord has a second law of pardon. That's repentance on your part and confession of those sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to this gospel message, then be encouraged by the song and pay attention and remember the message and respond if you need while we stand and sing.